So good morning, Susanna. Thank you very much for attending this interview. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, it's, it's my pleasure. Uh, usually I told you the questions, but the first question is, please can you tell something about yourself or who you are, what are you doing, your background maybe? Okay, I'm a drama therapist. Um, I was born in Argentina and I um, traveled around the world and lived in a few, quite a few countries. Um, at, uh, um, and I became, I, I studied drama therapy in, uh, in what was then Antioch, uh, a program that, of René Muna, and uh, now it's uh, CIIS. Um, I was among the first generations that came out of that, of that program. And um, I, I work with uh, mostly with um, adults, uh, actually mostly with women. And um, since I finished my, uh, my training in drama therapy, I lived in Mexico and then I moved to Israel and I live now in Jerusalem. Um, I am the head of the drama therapy graduate program at Tel High College in Galilee, where we have um, um, about 20 to 30 students a year. Um, it's, uh, it's the oldest program in the country and was, it was founded by Muli Lahad in the late eighties. So it's a program that, um, that has a lot of uh, history in, 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 in this country. And um, what was the question? <laughs> what else? <laughs> Say something about myself. Yes, yes. So um, yeah, I think more or less that's, that's <laughs> enough. Maybe some other things will come later on. Yes, yes, definitely. Thank you very much. I met Mule Lahat once in workshop uh, in basic PhD. It was adorable. It was beautiful. Yes, it's, it's very useful too. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so my first question is about assessment in drama therapy because you wrote article, uh, you summarized uh, all the approaches. I, you know, you talk about techniques, methods, how it's different. So this is the first question. Uh, maybe uh, some practical use of assessment. Uh, which assessment do you use? And also maybe my thoughts are about when we should use it and how important it is for drama therapy to use it. So many questions I know. So many questions, but I will start with saying that um, that um, when when I that kind of like I feel that I grew up with the field, in a sense, I got into drama therapy when both myself and the field were very young, mm -hmm. and so I I really feel that sometimes my development goes along with the development of the field, and one of the things that I remember really clearly. Uh, from my training and, and first years is that, you know, because drama therapy is a field where people come from so many different um, places. It's really very interesting. I, should, I think it should be, it's a, it's a good subject for a, for a thesis or something uh, mm -hmm. because people, you know, come from human resources, from folklore, from theater, from psychology. They are coming from many mm -hmm. different places. And so everyone brings their own tradition with them. And at the beginning in drama therapy, people really stuck to their, whatever they studied before drama therapy in order to make an assessment of the, of the clients that they were working with. So whoever came from psychology was sticking more to psychology mm -hmm. and the people who, who came from um, sociology or anthropology, they were doing their thing. And, uh, and the ones who came from theater were quite kind of like lost in terms of assessment, how to, 
assess this. So um, there was not a lot of assessment uh, at the beginning of the field. And, uh, or there was assessment connected to other fields, not really to drama therapy, that not, they were not integrated mm -hmm. into drama therapy. It's like you could see the stitches between mm -hmm. the that was made and the interventions in drama therapy. And, um, and I felt that drama therapy cannot really evolve as a field of its own, unless it had some kind of an assessment a device or something that was more integrated in, mm -hmm. um, in this field. And I think I was, um, because I was at the very beginning of the, of my development and the development of the field, I had a lot of questions when I studied that many of my teachers could, could not answer. And then my students, because I started to teach very soon, quite soon, mm -hmm. um, my students started to ask me the same questions and I felt like powerless and unable to answer many of the things. And that's how I began to, to develop the, what later became the, the six um, keys model uh, and to realize how important it is to have an assessment that begins with drama therapist thinking for the development of the field. Because when you work in drama therapy, let's say in the psychiatric department or in psychology clinic or something like that, people are not, the, the, the staff is not aware of some mm -hmm. aspect of drama therapy yeah. that they consider like very, very important. Like for example, aesthetic distance or what kind of um, modalities are being used. You know, is this person able to do role playing or is it, uh, possible only to work with projective tools, what mm -hmm. would, you know, so all these things that are absolutely important for us. Um, uh, when you work in, in, in a public psychology or, or not even public on a clinic or, or in some uh, place where there are psychiatrists, psychologists or, or teachers, they, they, the important thing is the content. They place a lot of mm -hmm of uh, emphasis on, so what did the client bring into the session? Did this child bring the, the divorce of their parents? Did, did, did the child talk about what happened with his sister? Did, you know, this is like mm -hmm. content, content, content. And for us, content is only one, one leg of the, of the thing. It's not the whole thing. Yeah. Um, and so that's how I became interested in, in developing a assessment tools within drama therapy, because if you don't do that, then you always kind of like fall back into um, not integrating your own, your own things. And so uh -huh. use drama therapy more as a technique to bring out the contents and then you assess these contents based on methods that are from other fields, which in a way it's fine, but then it places drama therapy in a very um, superficial level of a bunch of techniques. Mm -hmm. I think it's more than a bunch of techniques. I think yeah. it's a, a, a method, an approach. And so um, I thought it was very important to, to try to develop ways in which all the aspects that concern drama therapy could be integrated. And, uh, and that's how the, the process of the six keys evolved. And then I also became interested, actually I became interested in assessment in drama therapy very soon. Mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, and I, I knew that for example, um, um, Robert Landy was developing through the role methods mm -hmm. Uh, all the, the role theory and the role method, he was kind of like closer to developing some kind of assessment. Um, the taxonomy he, he wrote was interesting. He was kind of like looking also for, for some ways of, uh, of arranging the things in terms of drama therapy. Because if you don't have a way of assessing that, then you don't develop as, as a field. Mm -hmm. And um, 
And so then I, I at, at some point after developing the method, I got together with uh, David Johnson and Stephen Snow, and we kind of like tried to gather for the first time the all the, the main methods of assessment that people were using that were more like um, drama therapy based uh, methods. As to what I use personally, um, for me, the umbrella is the six keys, the six key model, because it is really, um, it connects, it dialogues with all the other methods. You know, each key is, is mm -hmm. like aspect yeah. and therefore it, you know, it integrates uh, the other methods as well. I also use a lot the EPR, so Jennings EPR. Mm -hmm. It's really a map for um, what, what can be used with a client, what will be the client's main way, most easy, the easiest way of expression. And, uh, and from there, how can you develop this, this kind of this, this ladder of the EPR so that, you know, things are, um, are tackled from different uh, perspectives uh, in, in a way and to, to develop all these functions that a person mm -hmm. must have, because we are all, it's not only the developmental part of this model, but we are all, um, we need embodiment for in life. We need projection and we need role. So, um, so it's like a way of connecting and, but also, yeah, of in, Kind of like understanding what a person does and what they need to do in order to progress mm -hmm. you know it's very important if you don't have assessment you don't know what progress is mm -hmm. you don't know how to measure yeah. how to yeah. assess if the person is getting better or is getting worse so even just you know in in that in that level and i also know that um many drama therapists um um, the word assessment is really frightening and mm -hmm. it's like something like, no, I don't do that. You know, assessment is kind of like measuring. Measuring is, is like, it's is not, I'm an artist. I'm an artist. I don't measure things, you know. So there is a lot of resistance of that. But I think there are like qualitative ways of assessment, of, of, of using assessment and of assessing people. And if you don't do that, you really get lost very easily uh -huh. working in drama therapy. Uh, third method I use a lot is the, is um, Robert Landis uh, role um, theories, and um, and the fourth method I use is um, uh, Mulila Had's basic pH. Uh -huh. it's really simple, um, also in in ways not necessarily as a methodical assessment, but I kind of like have it in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. When I work with clients, I try to understand what language are they using um, so that I can connect uh, with, the, with the person and then kind of like uh, create more like a, a methodic mm -hmm. um, understanding of, of the person. These are the main things I use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I also think it's very important to you uh, uh, to use assessment. That's the main question why I asked you because uh, I think you are raising awareness about that, and also maybe I can see some fear of assessment that not so many drama therapists understand why or what is it or how to use it. I would maybe continue the, with the question. You wrote some uh, practical illustration with Doris uh, in your article about six key assessment. And maybe I would like to ask you if you can give me some example, maybe a little bit more for understanding of to people or also deeply more understand how, to, how you use it, your assessment tools, practically yeah. in drama therapy. Yeah, okay. So when I have a meeting with a person, mm -hmm. client, uh, I usually afterwards, I kind of like write to myself things. Um, 
but uh, but it's not only the reflection as you know it's like i have it like it's an integrated thing i have it here mm -hmm. and so as the meeting goes on i'm already like you know uh, kind of like thinking of the six keys uh, all the time but i but in the end i i do uh, kind of like summarize it thinking like you know what happened in in the first key meaning how, is a person able to enter and exit dramatic reality properly and what do they need and mm -hmm. you know how what kind of dramatic reality are they creating is it like you know more like a projection uh, are they able to use role um how you know that you know mm -hmm. what kind of aesthetic distance what what kind of like spoke to their hearts what was the you know i tried to understand the the second key meaning the quality uh, of the of the dramatic reality created then i think about the, the uh, roles that came the the roles and the characters that came up in this session mm -hmm think about the contents what were the issues the issues the symbols that the person brought up then i think about the the fifth key is um how do they react to what they did in dramatic reality mm -hmm. did they seem to value to get something out of it or were there more like um like you know i don't know I am. I, I don't know if this is going to work. I, you know, where they, um, what was the, what value or they placed on on mm -hmm. the development that, or on the what they did in dramatic reality, and the six key meaning like you know was there anything that was in the air that was not said, mm -hmm. you know that could be things about transference. Or something like that, or it could be, you know, something that's going on, like, uh, like you know, like what's going on now in in this country. So, um, if I'm seeing someone who is an uh, Arab, then and I am a Jew, you know, there is a lot of things going on here. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't come to therapy to to talk about that, but we are in a context. Mm -hmm. Sometimes yeah. these things, you know, make you feel like you know that you are kind of like some like dancing a weird uh, dance of unspoken things. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so think about. So I kind of like move through the six keys, and I I get a picture. Usually, once I do that, there is like a, one of the keys is like calling. You know. Um, yeah. And then I see, okay, I need to work on developing this person's capacity to enter in dramatic reality, to feel more secure, because otherwise anything I will do is not going to work. Or, you know, thinking what kind of technique will help this person to, mm -hmm. to be, in, to, to, to create a more meaningful, a more juicy stuff you know mm -hmm. that it's not about talking about things um particularly for me working with with um adults um and so i this mm -hmm. is what I do i kind of like create like I, I i go through the keys and then i i i realize they make me realize what will be a good in intervention for the next mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. yeah it's bring me to question uh, do you do do this assessment like every drama therapy, or you use it like the mainly on the first and after the month of intervention? Of there is specific time, or it's still present and blinking in every drama therapy? What I do is usually I am aware of the keys um, because they are like you know like a light that you mm -hmm. kind of, yeah you see through this lens and then through this lens and then. You know, so I'm aware of this all every session. Mm -hmm. I don't do like an in-depth, um, you know, summary every session. I don't really do that. Every now and then I do like a more um, in-depth um, like analysis mm -hmm. of, of the person, of, the, of what's going on. And especially when I feel that I kind of like lost, 
myself like you know what what are we doing here because this is a mm -hmm. question that many people you know at some points when you go when you do psychotherapy like you know and work like um not with one goal like specific goal like it's not a, a behavioral or or a cbt you know it's really like when you work in psychotherapy then you open this file and this file and this file and this file and then at some point maybe you know there is some times when we are lost and we say what are we doing here mm -hmm. you know and so this means okay let's do an in-depth um work or or, or a summary of the of the keys and then usually i realize what is the where is the way you know it's it's mm -hmm. like a map that shows the way to what are we doing here mm -hmm. it will be progress in this in this case yeah. you told that you are mainly working with adults and also working with adults with uh substance use be behavior uh like many many drugs um uh, maybe my my question i'm interested do you see that some some of the key is maybe more often in spotlight that maybe you can see that some of the keys is working with adults they are usually not able to do you know to step into the role or maybe yes. they are not yeah. in spontaneous way yeah. or yeah Thinking that, you know, drama therapy for me is about really bringing people into some form of dramatic reality and back. Mm -hmm. so that every time we need to make. Some people, you know, like if you work with DBT, then your way of working with dramatic reality is a certain way. It's mainly in role. You yeah. don't have any objects Props. or anything yeah. other than yourselves. And so if you work with, um, with um, um, I don't know, with a uh, kind of, let's say, role, role methods or with psychodrama, then you may have like, you know, chairs or stuff like that. And you work mainly in role. If you work um, projectively, you will have like a sand tray or miniatures or whatever. Um, so, um, um but you need to have i think a good enough a good enough dramatic reality in order for our work to really work mm -hmm. because if the person is not really able to make that that entrance into an as if world um then anything that you do is not going to really it's like I, I think about it like a door, you know, that you create a door together with your client. Mm -hmm. Door should have a certain quality in order for for it to kind of like hold the content, whatever you are going to put into it, you know. When um, so, um, I think this is the most important thing uh, to see and to assess, especially with with adults, um, because we stopped playing mm -hmm. it's like very difficult for for an adult to really play um uh, it's it's either it's very childish seems like very regressive or also um it's the experts like you know i'm i'm not an actor i'm you know i i took theater when i was in school and i didn't like it I'm a shy person, so you say drama therapy is not for me, you know, and and so with adult people, it's very difficult to kind of like bring them into dramatic reality. Mm -hmm. With children, it's very difficult to bring them out, you know, they <laughs> to stay. And so um, it's it's really, I think each population has has their own, also each person, but populations also have um as a particular characteristic of their entrance into dramatic reality mm -hmm. with adults. I think we have to convince people that what they are doing is, uh, is, um, is okay. That, you know, that it's okay to, to kind of like be, uh, to play, uh, to be playful. Um, really going into dramatic reality with someone 
it, there is a lot of intimacy that is built when you do that <clears throat> it's like you feel that you you are very close you need to trust the person that that what you do or say in the as if is mm -hmm. you know you're not going to be ridiculed or analyzed or you know so there's a lot of trust that goes into that and and so it's a, it's a process in which if you don't create intimacy you can't go into dramatic reality but if you you know if you go into dramatic reality you create intimacy mm -hmm. so it goes like both ways and um and i think this is the most important thing in in drama therapy because many other therapies are you know you can talk about your things and your feelings and um but if you don't really do some kind of like um enter entrance of dramatic reality then you are doing psychotherapy but not drama therapy yeah so i don't know i i forgot what the question was now you perfectly answered me i'm okay <laughs> because uh, for me um usually uh i'm living this with with my clients that of uh, if they are joining the therapeutic community and drama therapy for drama therapy for the first time they are usually saying i don't like drama therapy it's a child childish i was like a child and i'm asking why you I, I was behaving like a child and my question is sometimes like and is it bad to behave like a child or why is it bad to being a childish usually the question for me is what's what's happening in our life that we forgot to to be playful or how it's happening that we forgot playfulness and playing means something childish and also i can see that this is like the really easy short way to uh work with the teams of the clients because you mentioned psychotherapy and for me many times you can you can hide yourself behind the words because you are just talking and now you have your own body and you have to express something and it's like really easy to step into the process and it's very fast it's maybe sometimes what what scares me you know it's really fast and the trauma therapist should be really aware what is happening and if i can hold it in my hand yes yes it's uh it, it really makes accelerates uh, the process and i think mm -hmm. also that's why because going into dramatic reality is an invitation to kind of like dream in a waking state it's like we are inviting people to dream in a wake being awake and dream at the same time it's it, so it's like some a feeling that when you dream when we dream we dream on our own it's like it's only in your own head mm -hmm. and Oh, and the and the brain is doing everything there and it's connecting things and it's processing things and it happens inside your head and nobody sees it but when you are doing drama therapy it becomes public it becomes visible it's like really making the invisible visible <laughs> and so it's like sharing your dream with someone who's there and so it can be frightening mm -hmm. and and it can be um it's it's really you need to trust as i said before and it's intimate and and it accelerates it's like you mm -hmm. goes out of your control so um so we do have some techniques that bring you know like projection for for example uh, with adults i usually start with projection i don't want to scare people you know so i start with something that will still give them an image and, and a sense of what it is that we do in drama therapy mm -hmm. um, and will allow some play um, and, and it still con is connected with the body in a very basic way but you know because if someone comes and, and, and starts saying okay this is my problem and blah 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 and then you know I said okay could you just you know walk around the room 
and uh, and find three objects that that you find that are could be related to to the problem that you bring here. Mm -hmm. So the person has to stand up. It's like, oh my God, in psychotherapy, we sit on the chair. We don't stand up. So yeah. it's already standing up and it's going around the room. It's really considering the space and it's really checking things. And, and you know, and I encourage people, don't just bring the first thing that, you know, that caught your attention. Go around, you know, look at the objects and, you know, and pick really when you are ready. And so they already have done all this. They are becoming familiar with the space. And then they, they come with the three objects and then ah, sit down again. <laughs> and, and so, but we've already done, it's like a very, it's like a, a, um, a small step for, for a human being, a big step for drama therapy. <laughs> this is the way it, it, it yeah. works. So that per, the, this person, the next time I say, Maybe we stand up and do something they've already done. Mm -hmm. So, um, so working with adults, you really need to kind of like measure things that are like you know they that they feel to create the the sense of of a security that they mm -hmm. need in order to to do something like that. So I usually start with projection. Um, I mean, because I know. Know that people that come, um, they, they they don't, you know, they. I, if you say, okay, let's stand up and mm -hmm. make movement and say, us make a sound. It's like, you know, what is this? Why should I do that? You know, I have a problem. You know, help me. Why should I do all these noises? Mm -hmm. And uh, so you need to kind of like uh, do a very very methodic like uh, opening until mm -hmm. you can say, well, you know. We do this, and and with uh, with youngsters or with people who are like um, or more, um, um, yeah, with uh, who are not adults enough that you know that they can still uh, feel too childish. Sometimes I say mm -hmm. like, um, well, what we are going to do some some theater exercises like real actors do. Um, so these are, you know, from the studio, uh, da, 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 or these are like, you know, like real actors. And so it's like, ah, okay, this is like, you know, a real, I'm a real actor. So that makes sense. Uh, you know, that, that kind of like taking that into putting that into that, uh, in that, mm -hmm. context. but you, you need to be able to negotiate and see what is the, the, uh, main, um, like a opening that they have the main channel into dramatic reality mm -hmm. and you kind of like build it um, in this way yeah it looks like that's it's worldwide that adult people that seems to be you know fearful of plainness playfulness yes it's in israel it's in czech republic i Yes. Uh, the drama therapy with Chinese yes. people, they also yes. have the same issues in USA. It's interesting. Usually, I think culturally, it's 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 seen like, you know, playing is very, very um, good when you're a child. People can mm -hmm. see that children play and that that's how you study and that's how you learn about the world and that's, you know... And then you reach a point when, okay, enough, that's it. Mm -hmm. Only certain things are are possible. Like, you know, you want to play, okay, soccer, football, you know, the, you are a man, here, here's your ball, go and play. You know, <laughs> it's like, you can play sports, you can play uh, cards. Uh, there are certain things that are allowed, yes, yeah. you know, but but not uh, free playing. Uh, you know, it's really something that only happens in intimacy with your best friends, with your mm -hmm. loved, with, you know, it's like something that is very, very, it's like when you are, feel very, very secure, um, then you can do that. You can allow these sides of you, but to do that in public or with a stranger, um, 
with you know that's like no why should i do that yeah and mm. um, also maybe now as you are talking i'm thinking about if the free play isn't a little bit connected with madness for adult people maybe because sometimes the people saying we are looking like crazy we are pl just playing uh, even my clients in psychiatric hospital they are saying drama therapy is something like we are in in psychosis or whatever and after that they say oh but we are in psychiatric okay it's not okay <laughs> uh it's just yeah. it's my actual now the thoughts came to me maybe yeah i think yes i think in a way um for people with psychiatric um backgrounds or difficulties um and I, I'm, i'm not really as an expert on this particular population but i know something about this that it's really scary Uh, to go into dramatic reality because that is connected with madness that is connected mm -hmm. you know just you know the invisible becomes visible and you know they hear these voices and they, you know it's real it's real you don't have to make it happen it's real real and they can't go back you know this is a first key thing it's like the first key is going yeah. and coming back it's like they can't find the door to say like you know okay this i'm out now so it's it's really connected to to the experience of of madness mm -hmm. um and so that is also why it's very difficult for them to kind of like transcend uh, as mulis lahad would say transcend into fantastic reality it's like they they feel that you know what if i can't come back Mm -hmm. because they have experienced things that are uh, real for them but for not uh, they know that not for the rest of the people so it's it's really scary to make mm -hmm. to go into that road and still i think it is not only possible but also uh, recommended because uh, experiencing um dramatic reality and knowing that this is as if is is a way of validating some of the things that you know that that go on inside your head or or your mind mm -hmm. or something and then you know but knowing that this this is in my mind you know that there is a, a, a it's a reality within a reality mm -hmm. and so seeing the subjective aspects of it Uh, differentiating between the two worlds that you know something that for example for children is really very difficult and so sometimes they, they you know we all have heard about this child who jumped up the window thinking that he's superman or something like that we you know it's it's difficult to differentiate be between these two uh, realities even to to the age of like you know six or seven sometimes is more like um, mm -hmm. complex to know to to really know what is real and what is like my my fantasy world the fantasy world is very very rich and uh and uh and real mm -hmm. and so and later in life you know you differentiate it and i think culture schools and uh, education all the educational system really makes sure that you don't go back into that playground again <laughs> like you know that studying is sitting in front of a book or a computer that is studying is not about playing things playing and studying become mm -hmm. worse yeah. and uh, and so the whole um the whole system really makes it uh, very difficult to for people to to play as adults because you you know you've been estranged from that realm yeah. of playing it's true that many times in school you can hear don't be so childish mm -hmm. and it's me the mean the the person is playful don't be childish mm -hmm. it's many question for me uh 
I talked with my girlfriend yesterday about uh, the small boy with HDHD and how often he's trapped in in his reality in the, in the his head his head and also because I have been uh, diagnosed as HDHD as I was a kid. I still can understand because sometimes I'm so trapped in in my head in my in my own reality that I don't even uh, see the world around me. I just completely forgot about the world. So it's interesting that if you have kind of disorder, mm -hmm. it uh, make you more playful, maybe. Yeah, yeah. But but the question is like yeah, I think the the the, the general culture is really making very clear that you know play playfulness is over mm -hmm. at a certain time like you know playful is not um serious if you are playful then you are not serious and you are an adult you have to be <laughs> serious and so and and we all um grow up in this uh, and it doesn't matter at least you know i th i think uh, in many cultures it's not something in one culture yeah. There are different cultures that you know are like exceptions to the rule but but mostly this is the way it is that at, at a certain point you have to say goodbye to playfulness and then the invisible becomes either religion which is like you know ritual is allowed or mm -hmm. games there are certain games that are allowed but you know um, acting is for the experts and uh and playing is out, that's it. You are not, you know, allowed to play really free play uh, anymore, unless you are like in the intimacy of, of a relationship, mm -hmm. yeah. It's interesting how you talk about this. I never, I never have been thinking about this thing like, like you are thinking about like how we need the structure and specific plays and the rules for playfulness. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. So moving to another question, or uh, that's uh, my maybe my question. How many time now. do you have? Um, I have I have a like you know ten more minutes or so. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Uh, the I have two questions. I will uh, let you pick pick up what you want to answer. One question is, uh, which approaches do you use? And another question, how do you think the humor is related to drama traffic? Mm -hmm. So pick whatever you want. Okay. What is closer now? Maybe I, I, will, I will start with what approaches I use. And, uh, uh -huh. and I, I would say that um, my, my theoretical framework is um, on the one hand, I am coming like from the narrative therapy. I think narrative mm -hmm. therapy is very um, um, approachable as a drama therapist. Mm -hmm. So this is the framework that you know I, that I think in terms of like you know that people really story their lives. That sometimes the way the life is storied is not good for the person, and that you need to help people kind of like find alternative narratives that will help them um, move on. I do think of, of people coming to therapy as some kind of a hero that has lost the way, mm -hmm. you know, that doesn't know how the, how the plot continues, that go back to the same thing or that are stuck in their, in their plot or something like that. So, um, so this is one, one aspect. Um, another aspect that um, I, I use is like, you know, like, a, I would call it like a feminist um, kind of like approach thinking in, in, mm -hmm. in, in terms of context that, you know, that it's not like if, if the, the woman that comes to see me has difficulties with her mother, it's not only about her mother, or if she has difficulties with her body, it's not only about herself, you know, that we, we can see context in, mm -hmm. in general. And so these are important things in, in my approach. Um, uh, but I kind of like all these are filtered uh, through drama therapy, 
um, use. And so um, I, um, I use, um, I may use a, a lot of uh, creative writing, metaphor, uh, projective tools. Mm -hmm. uh, I use uh, uh, psychodramatic techniques, mm -hmm. empty chair and that. Um, I use a lot of body um, kind of like focusing uh, techniques and mindfulness uh, things to kind of go and, and mm -hmm. work the body and um, and boal mm -hmm. boals uh, techniques which are very useful with people that are non actors and so a lot of image theater um, even with not only with groups, but also with, I'm thinking about individuals now, mm -hmm. um, like image theater and, uh, and, and changing, transforming images. Um, um, and um, yeah, I don't know if this is what you meant because- Yeah, yeah. It's not like, you know, it's, it's not like I use DVT or you know or this and and I I, I use a lot of um, thinking in terms of EPR mm -hmm. and uh, role theory. Yeah, for example, they are very helpful to, for example, to to think about okay, this is the role that the person brings, and now what would be the counter role of that, or just picking up like you know when when someone says something that I can hear the, the voice of the counter role in the, in the background or mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. phrase these things in terms of role and counter role. Um, for example, uh, you know, this is uh, many years ago, uh, a woman came to see me um, because she had received a scholarship to finish her thesis. And all she had to do was wake up in the morning, finish her thesis, and you know she didn't need to work or anything. She just had like you know she was covered for all her expenses and everything, and she wouldn't be able to to uh, to to wake up you know and get out of her bed. She got very depressed, and so um, so I started to work with her um, on this. And it, it seemed really, really clear that there were the, the, there were two people speaking. Like she would come and say, you know, one more week, I didn't get out of bed. Every day, I just don't have the energy to do it. Mm -hmm. When it's like, <laughs> I hear this, like, you know, I see this banging and she was so mad at herself. And so it's like, I, I, you know, at some point I said, well, I hear there are two. There is one that is very, very mad at another that is not waking up and getting out of bed. So there are two people speaking here. Uh -huh. Why don't we just, you know, kind of talk to each one and see what each one, who is this one? This one has energy. So we started working with this. And, and this thing happened like, you know, many it happens many times that people mm -hmm. come, they don't realize that there is another side of themselves, that they bring a, a side of themselves to therapy um, and they want to fix it. Uh, so um, so I, I, I use sometimes the, the role model. It's very useful to work with adults. Um, and I also use a lot of um, stories um, like universal stories, mm -hmm. which is like, you know, a, a way my, and, and another thing that I, I use is dramatic resonances, like the using, telling the, the, the story from uh, different points of view, from different distances. And one of the, the resonances that I use is the, the universal resonance, which is about bringing a story like, oh, what you, what we did today reminds me of a story. And the mm -hmm. story is about, there was an old man that went to the mountains and blah, 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 blah. And then sometimes they, they really fit. And sometimes we, 
we um, we take on that universal story mm -hmm. working and or I use structures of stories like um, I use story not not the uh, not that particular story but just use the structure of a story like oh you told me that you know you went to look for a job they said no job now then you know you went another time no job now and then you know it's like so it's like as if there is this hero that goes mm -hmm. on a journey and then it's like no then the second time no but there is a third time you know, in a story, you can't go back to the same thing three times. It's as, you know, people leave the story. It's in a story, the first time doesn't work, the second time doesn't work, the third time something happened. So imagine that, you know, this is a character in a story. What would be different? What could, so I use story structures um, to kind of like help people to, uh, to think of alternatives or like, you know, this like, uh, um, like one day, you know, and this and that was bad and was bad and everybody was sad and blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. One day. So what, you know, what could happen one day? So I, I use the, the structure mm -hmm. story to help people move on in their hero journey. Um, something like that. And I, I guess, you know, we are like with... I will say a few words about this, the, the humor that you ask me, and then we'll, we'll finish with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I found a, many years ago, or several years ago, that, uh, that really I, I met uh, this amazing group of clowns that, that were um, doing medical clowning, and mm -hmm. I, I felt that... Um, that it was so connected to drama therapy, was really connected to drama therapy in, in a way that they didn't think about and that we didn't think about. And uh, because it's really um, theater, like, you know, drama, um, only that they, it's, everything is done through their character. It's like they, they are like, uh, clowns are like a walking, dramatic reality wherever they go everything becomes as if and and so they engage people in that and and uh, and this is something that happens that is very very powerful um that part of it has to do with the humor uh because humor is 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 healthy uh, it's it's uh one of the resources of the imagination like in Mulilaha that speaks of the basic pH and imagination being one, one resource. It's like, you know, believe, affect, uh, social, imagination, cognitive and physical. These are the six resources. And the imagination resource has humor. Mm -hmm. So when you are able to make a joke of, of, of something, of a situation, you are already transcending this situation and you are able to like look at it as in an as if, a way. Mm -hmm. So the clowns are not only using humor, but also using the imagination to engage people and create a certain state of mind that allows transformation. Something can happen because you stop being like, you know, stuck in this, you kind oh. of like something relax and, and something else can happen. You are more open and more receptive. Uh, to other parts of yourself or something like that. So I really felt like we were like two breeds of like, you know, like drama therapy that grew in a, in a, in a different planet or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and that uh, we could really connect uh, they, the uh, clown, the therapeutic use of clowning uh, grew up a lot in the hospitals, in mental, in, not in mental health, in, 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 in hospitals, in general hospitals, um, in, as medical clowning. And, uh, and drama therapy grew up in, in, in psychology, in psychiatric uh, units, in education, 
and all that. So it seemed like, you know, we were like being nurtured by different um, mothers, <laughs> kind of, but, uh, but we were connected. There was like a family resemblance uh, in this. So I, I, I think uh, there is a lot of things that can be learned mm -hmm. uh, from using the clown and using humor in, mm -hmm. in drama. Yeah. So it's just amazing. Like I, I, I had to make a note about the humor because as you mentioned, basic pH, I was also thinking how humor is connecting with social and with physiological, because you can uh, many mm -hmm. times you can see that in embodiment and embodied, you know, experience of the people. Yeah. Really. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh my. Oh my God. Thank you very much, Susanna, for our interview. It was Thank really inspiring for, for me. Thank you. Thank you. For me, it was great as well to go back to these questions and uh, reflect upon what I do. Yes, so amazing. I'm also very honored and and very thankful as well. Thank you. I'm, I'm honored, and I hope. Uh, that some people will watch it and will bring them some more awareness about all these teams and will help them. I, I hope that's why I do that. Thank you. Great. Please send me the, the link to your uh -huh. That would be great. 